Welcome back everyone who's watching on Moodle or watching it later. Um, worked in an evolutionary biology lab on cichlids. So I think that QTL mapping is one of these. Yeah, lots of QTL. Yeah. Yeah, plants are really, really, they, they use a lot of QTL mapping in plants, also in, in model animals. So good. Um, so we will go into more detail. So everything here hangs on heritability. So um, this is the basic formula where we start off with, right? It only has three terms. It has the variance in the phenotype is determined by the variance caused by the genetic part and variance caused by the environment. Um, of course, this has as a very weird consequence um, that heritability can change without any genetic change. So if you say like how heritable is, for example, your um, your height, like right? human stature, the, the height of a certain person, um, then that can change. That can just change based on the environment. If there's more environmental influence, then of course the, the, the heritability goes down. If there's less genetic and uh, if there's less environmental variation, then the heritability goes up. So when people say that a certain phenotype has a certain heritability, they also should tell you under which conditions this heritability was determined. Um, and people usually forget this. People usually um, think of heritability as something which is static and cannot change unless there are changes in the genetics. Um, but that's not true. Heritability can change also based on the environment, um, which is is an open field of, of research in QTL mapping and in heritability research. Um, so when you estimate heritability, um, then of course you have the phenotypic variance in a trait. The variance of P is of course determined by the variance in the genetics and the variance in the environment. But there's always a term um, which um, people never talk about, and that is the interaction between the genes and the environment. And that's two times the covariance between the G and the E. And why do we never talk about it? Because when we do experiments, um, we can control the, the covariance, and we usually assume that the covariance between the genetics and the environment is zero. Have we don't have, when we do an experiment, all the animals in the experiment are under similar environment conditions, or all the plants are growing in a greenhouse which is very similar. Have, if we if we would do an experiment and we would say, well, all the Arabidopsis plants are being put at 20 degrees Celsius, um, and all the um, Arabidopsis uh, of a different ecotype are put under a different um, temperature. Then, then you have to deal with this G times E effect, right? It might be that some um, ecotypes of the plant uh, work better at, for example, high altitude where the oxygen is lower. Yeah, so then the genotype and the environment have a certain interplay with each other. Um, but the normal definition of heritability, so the broad sense heritability, is just the variance of the genotype divided by the variance in the phenotype in the population as a whole. So that's kind of the broad sense heritability. So broad sense heritability is very easily defined um, in a an, an laboratory or in an environmental setting by saying that, well, we can measure how much variance is caused by the genetic architecture. We can calculate the variance that we see in our population. And when we divide these two numbers by each other, then we get the heritability. Heritability is always written as H2, um, so um, ha to the power of two, and this is due to um, Sewall Wright. Um, that's something that was just decided in 1900 or around 1900 uh, when they were doing the first calculations of heritability and, and looking at how phenotypes are passed from father to mother. And the guy that came up with one of the first papers, he used H as the correlation coefficient, which nowadays we call R. Um, and because H was the correlation coefficient, uh, the, the variance explained by the correlation is uh, H to the power of two. So, but when we use heritability, we always talk about H to the power of two. Um, and when we use a capital H, we talk about the broad sense heritability. And then there's also the narrow sense heritability. The narrow sense heritability is denoted by 
a small letter h to the power of 2 and this is only the additive variance so additivity we already talked i think about additivity yeah, but if we have a genetic marker so you can be homozygous aa you can be homozygous bb or you can be a heterozygote and then the additive heritability is the the the, the, the is is when a a, B, and B, B, when A, B group is exactly between uh, the two homozygote parents. Um, so additive variance is variance caused by additive alleles, and this is the narrow sense heritability, and this is caused only by the additive alleles, so the, 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 the formula changes, so instead of the variance of G, so the variance coming from the genome, we now talk only about the variance of uh, the variance which is which is caused by additive alleles and this this the, the difference is is that normally for example when we are dealing with plants or when we are dealing with animals uh, then we talk about broad sense heritability but when we talk about cattle or humans we generally talk about the narrow sense heritability because the narrow sense heritability is easier to um, to change um, and to use in, in breeding programs. So when, when someone says that this cow is very good, um, then that is usually based on the uh, narrow sense heritability because that is the part of the heritability um, which is used in, in breeding and breeding estimates for cattle or other animals. All right, so two types of heritability, broad sense and narrow sense heritability. So if you want to estimate heritability, there are actually two schools of thought as well. So there's the Sewell Wright, who is responsible for why it is uh, H2. Um, and then we have the uh, Ronald Fisher school of thought. And Sewell Wright school of thought is just to analyze uh, correlations using uh, regression. Um, so that is just when you have, uh, 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 it, when, you, when you have the, um, total variance and then you calculate the correlation uh, then it, the, the, the variance explained by the correlation so if you have a single marker and you split the individuals um, like this right um, then in, instead of doing a, a an analysis of variance and uh, you would just draw a single straight line and then how well the line is correlated with the original data gives you the heritability um, and then you have Fisher who said no you should calculate heritability by using analysis of variance or do ANOVA analysis uh, which is slightly different. Um, the thing that I always like the most is just to um, to have an experiment right and have an uh, experiment to calculate the heritability and this is more or less the narrow sense heritability which you calculate so I'm, I wanted to explain this figure and when we have the parent generation then here you see the parent generation. So this is just a, a kind of histogram and you see that the parent generation um, has a certain mean and it has a certain standard deviation and it normally phenotypes are normally distributed so you have like a normal distribution um, and now if you want to calculate the heritability what you do is from the parent generation you select certain parents right so here we are selecting parents which are on average having a phenotype value of 7 while the whole population only has a phenotype value of 5 right so we're just selecting parents which are larger than the average then we make a new generation based on these parents right and now we see that the children have a mean of 6 so we put some selective pressure on the parents by selecting the largest ones and then we look to see what the kind of response is to the selection in the children um, so when we do that the additive heritability is very basically it's just r divided by s so a question to you guys what is the heritability in this little example hey, where the parent generation has a mean of five the selected parents have a mean of seven and then had the children end up having a mean of of six Looking at you, chat, this is your time to shine. And it's okay to get it wrong. That an answer is better than no answers, because then we're just stuck on this slide forever and ever. Um, so... <laughs> 
86%. That's, an, that's a good, good guess. Um, but no. <laughs> Anyone else? Alexander, like 10 points for participation. That, uh, 50. 50 as in 50 units or 50 speed or 50%. 50% I think you mean, Commando. Yeah, percent. Yeah, yeah, 50%. It's actually 50% because S is determined as the selection pressure relative to the mean of the parental generation and then the response is also determined um, relative to the parental generation. So R in this case is 1 and S is 2. Um, so this is 1 divided by 2 is 50% heritable. So the phenotype that we're looking at is 50% heritable, 50% determined by the environment. Didn't expect to be right. Well, it happens. <laughs> okay, so that this is the this is this is just one of these experiments that you can use to use her, uh, to to estimate heritability. Of course, there's many many ways to estimate heritability. Like in humans, we usually look at full sips versus half sips. Um, so hey, if you're a full sibling, um, hey, so you share the same father and mother, then you share 50% of your genome. While if you're a half sip, so you only have the same father, then you share on average 25% of your genome. Um, and so in, in humans, we look at the difference between these two. What if R is higher than S? Um, that should not occur. It does in, in real world examples, but it should not. <laughs> so um, because of the definition, right, that the phenotypic variance is genetic plus environment, um, would one speak of 120% heritability? No, no, heritability is defined as a number between zero and 100. Um, so if R happens to be higher than S, uh, then something in the environment must have changed. Um, yeah, for example, if the parental generation is grown at uh, 18 degrees Celsius, and then the child generation you grow at 24 degrees Celsius, then it could happen that R is larger than S. Um, but in general, it's not. Um, so it, it, does, it does sometimes happen. Um, but that usually has to do with environmental effects, which are not compensated for. Additive effects in a multilocus trait. No, because here we're just looking at the response of the whole genome, right? Um, we we don't care if, you, if, hey, if a trait is Mendelian, um, then R would be S, so 100%. Um, if a trait is non-Mendelian, is R always in the middle? Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's, that, yeah. Um, although I... I have my thesis here, um, and in my thesis we actually looked at that in Arabidopsis for metabolites, and then um, let me guys, um, let me switch you guys to full screen, put myself in the middle. So in my thesis here we have this really nice figure. Um, so this figure that I made here, here you see the parental. Um, lines, right? So you see the parental lines being minus one and positive one. So the lowest parent is just standardized to minus one and the other one is standardized to positive one. And then you see that the children for trait number one, so on the y-axis we see, oh, on the y-axis, um, this kind, we see all of the different phenotypes that we measured. So in this case we measured like 160 different phenotypes um, and you can see that um, the children, for many phenotypes, the children are actually never larger or smaller than the parents. Even on the top here, where we see a whole bunch of, of children which are larger than the largest parent, and some children which are smaller than the smallest parent, the average of this trait still falls in between the largest parent and the smallest parent. And because, because we're dealing with, um, with populations, right, so we're dealing not just uh, with um, an individual measurement, we're always dealing with like a whole bunch of measurements, um, R generally tends to fall into the middle. Um, and that's just the way that it works. Um, but yeah, there can be children, hey, and you can see this in the graph as well, like the, the parents have been selected up to 10, but here in this, um, oh, you can't see my mouse, so here in this um, graph, it could be that some children are even larger than the largest parent, some children will be smaller than the smallest parent that you, than you took, um, but the, the average of the child population generally falls like 99% of the time between 
the uh, mean of the original parent generation and the selected parents for the next generation. All right. So this is just a very basic analysis, right? So you need to have a population, you need to be able to select animals, you have to force them to mate with each other. But that of course doesn't work in humans. So in humans you have to um, deal or you have to use uh, full siblings or half siblings uh, and then compare phenotypes within populations of these. Um, so general, uh, if you want to do it using analysis of variants, for example, if you have sires, um, and like in cows, so you have a lot of different cows or a lot of different bulls and you mate these bulls with random uh, cows uh, then of course uh, every child gets half of their genes from the father, half of the genes from their randomly chosen mother so you can then analyze it using this following linear model where you say that the phenotype of individual um, IJ is determined by the father that they had and a certain er error term and then what you look at is how much variance is explained by this father term and then you do that times two and then you divide that by the total variance in the phenotype and then that is your heritability estimate for this phenotype right so in this case we would have like five uh, bulls or ten bulls every bull will have 20 or 40 offspring and what we then do is we put up the linear model where we say well the father is the explanatory variable and so we map the variance onto the father that the child came from um, and then we compute the heritability um, by looking at the variance explained by the father we have to multiply that by two right because children only get half of their genes from the father um, and then we compare that to the total variance so in this case we leave kind of the the, the cows out of out of because they are randomly chosen um, so this is more or less how you do it by analysis of variance of course this this becomes very complex if you have multiple environments or other things um, but in this is kind of the basic structure to estimate the heritability so you look at the variance explained by the father term and you divide that by the the total variance um, of the phenotype all right, so the relationship to the DNA is, I think, very clear that heritable traits are known to be passed from one generation to the next via the DNA, which encodes genetic information. Um, so DNA allows you to pass information from one generation to the next generation. Um, DNA also allows for modification and mutations, right? So um, a novel mutation um, could cause um, S to be larger, or could cause R to be larger than S, yeah, because we always assume that nothing changes from father or from from the parent generation to the offspring generation but of course uh, novel mutations that occur could push some individuals out of the range of the parents um, and DNA is responsible for kind of generating semi-random offspring genotypes because you get half of your genome from your father half of your genome from your mother um, but of course um, you don't get whole chromosome one from father, whole chromosome one from mother. No, there's also um, a, a, a recombination uh, in the meiosis, which happens, which swaps part of chromosome one with other parts of chromosome one. So how does this work? DNA works via crossover. So um, have the first step in, 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 in creating gametes so to create like sperm cells or egg cells is that had we have something which is in um, in the a f in the a phase um, and then in B step here um, is where the homologous uh, recombination occurs and so we first have uh, chromosome 1 chromosome 2 they get duplicated so we have two copies of chromosome 1 two copies of chromosome 2 um, what happens then is that these things are then attached to spindle poles within the um, within the nucleus and then the cell is separated into two cells um, but what happens is is that um, you get these merged chromosomes right so your 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 father has a copy of your chromosome from his father and a copy of his mother um, and he exchanges parts of the chromosome that he got from his father with the chromosome that he got from his mother so you end up with this kind of hybrid chromosomes these are then pulled in out of each other again to create gametes and these gametes now contain like part of so chromosome one contains part of this blue chromosome um, and it contains uh, a part it could be a whole red or it could be 
split at a different point. Um, I hope that's clear. Um, uh, meiosis is not really my, uh, my, my strong part, but step one is the replication of the DNA. So DNA gets replicated, so you have chromosome one, chromosome two. Those get duplicated, uh, chromosome one and chromosome one. So if this, is, this is your father who has chromosome one from his mother, chromosome one from his father. He duplicates the chromosomes they recombine so there's recombination uh, recombination here and then these are pulled ag apart again and then in the end you end up with with four different sperm cells but the dna in each of these sperm cells is slightly different because of the recombination step um, because of the homologous recombination and then the separation so this happens in several phases. So we start off with using uh, prophase one. Um, yeah, so the chromosome condenses, the nuclear envelope breaks down and crossing over occurs. Yeah, so this is then, then this part here. Um, and then we have metaphase one where pairs of homologous chromosomes move to the equator of the cells and then they are pulled um, by the spindles into separate partitions of the cell after which uh, the cells divide and makes two new cells. So this only happens of course in um, sperm cells and egg cells. This doesn't happen um, in normal cells. Normal cells do normal meiosis um, but um, uh, this is the, the meiosis, not the standard cell division but cell division for um, creating sperm cells and egg cells. Um, and so um, this is another diagram so the spindles form around the chromosomes uh, the chromosomes line up at the equator and then they divide and then they they match up um, using homologous recombination all right that's that's just the way that it works but what we are interested in is how do we how are we able to track these changes in the dna um, so one of the things that we used to use a lot in the old days which is strange because I don't feel to be old or I don't feel myself to be very old um, but when I started in like 2010 perhaps 2008 with my master and after that my PhD um, we still used a lot of uh, restriction fragment length polymorphisms um, has so our uh, RFLP markers so um, this means that we have an A allele and uh, a big A allele and a small A allele so this is chromosome 1 version 1, this is chromosome 1 version 2 um, and of course there are DNA mutations so in this case we have uh, three cleavage sites um, in the big A so we get if we would cut this DNA we would get, get one part, two part, three part, four parts uh, we would get one, two, three and four so we would get four parts if we would cut the DNA using restriction enzymes when we have the big A when we have the small A there's actually a non-functional cut site um, so we would get only one, two, three parts so hey, this is just based on simple PCR so you, you cut up your DNA you put it on a gel and then in the one case for the big A you see three um, bands and here you only see two bands um, yeah, so the restriction fragments are just separated according to their length and then here yeah, we have this labeled DNA probe and yeah, so here we have a DNA probe which labels here so in this case we pull out a fragment in this in the large A which is small and in the small A we pull out a large large fragment um, so if you would look at a gel yeah, so this, this would be the, the the polymerase gel then normally it has to be turned around but for clarity I did it like this so hey, if you have um, it actually should be turned the other way around. No, it shouldn't. So if you have small A, then you have a big fragment. If you are a heterozygote, then you have two fragments. And if you are homozygous AA, then you have like a, a, a smaller fragment. Is this clear? I think I messed up a little bit with the long and s small. But yeah, we cut the DNA into random pieces. We label this part of the DNA. So we have a probe which targets this specific part of DNA um, and then when we put it on a gel uh, then we see that the AA individuals, small a individuals, uh, they have a longer fragment because they are missing a cut site here and this is called RFLP markers so random fragment length polymorphisms. So you just use a DNA cutting enzyme like uh, ACOR R4 um, and then you cut up the DNA and then you target like a very specific piece and long and short fragments based on the fact that some 
DNA has a cut site while the other version of the DNA does not. So if it's unclear, just shout out in chat. Um, and so RFLP can also be done when you have a variable number of tandem repeats. So VNTRs are very common in the genome, common in the genome of plants, but also um, in the common or in the genome of animals. So it doesn't have to be a cleavage site which is broken. Um, it could also be a structure which looks like this, um, where, for example, um, you have an AT repeat. So some animals have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven AT repeats in their genome, while others only have four. Right? So now the length of the A fragment will be larger compared to the length of the small A fragment um, because the, the, of the fact that there's a variable number of repeats in, in the DNA. Um, and this is also called RFLP, um, but this is an RFLP based on a VMTR, so a variable number of tandem repeats, um, while this is just based on the fact that a cut site might be mutated um, and the, the cutting enzyme cannot cut the DNA at this point. So VMTRs are still used a lot I think in plants. In mice we still have the mice VNTR panel um, where there's RFLP markers um, which are based on the fact that you have repeats in the genome and the length of these repeats is different between individuals. So and this is the way that we can do um, discovery. Nowadays actually we don't use this a lot. Like the last five years I've only been working with SNP chip data. Um, so SNP chip there's a single nucleotide polymorphism so some animals have an A, other animals might have a G at this location. Um, and so you use a SNP chip uh, to kind of um, figure out what an animal has. If, it, if an animal has an AA then it's, then it's first variant, if it has an AG it's a heterozygote and if it has GG it's homozygote the other variant. Um, but there are many different techniques that you can use to, to kind of measure DNA and determine if a fragment comes from the father or comes from the mother. Um, like DNA sequencing, but also mass spectrometry, we can use like single base extension or uh, hybridization, but this all of this is aimed at just being able to quantify if the DNA came from the, from the one parent or if the DNA came from the other parent. So SNP chips are, uh, they contain like these immobilized allele specific oligonucleotide probes. Um, they are, so you fragment the, the target DNA, you label it with fluorescent dye and then you detect to and you record the hybridization signal. So this is kind of how the human uh, gene chip looks from, from Affymetrix. So it's just a little, um, little glass plate. On this glass plate you have different uh, oligonucleotide probes, so this has 50,000 different probes on there, I think. Um, Snipper A6. Oh, this is a Snipper A6, so this already has 100,000 little pieces of DNA on there. Well, 100,000 different little pieces of DNA. Of course, the DNA is in there like 100,000 times as well. Um, and then hey, you, you just hybridize your sample to this, um, so you extract DNA, you cut it up into little pieces, and then you put it on the array, um, and you you, based on the color signal you can see if an individual had an A there, if it had a G there, or if it had an A and a G there. So the first paper, and this is a really interesting paper to read because um, Eric Lander and David Botstein, they are the inventors of QTL mapping. So this paper was published in 1989, so you can see that QTL mapping is a very novel technique. Um, it was only developed when I was already six years old. Um, so it is man mapping Mendelian factors, underlying quantitative traits uh, using RFP linkage maps. So only in 1989 um, did someone come up with a fact like, oh, we have this DNA, we now have these techniques like RFLP to determine where it comes from, from which parent, um, and then they, they showed how to do this association analysis. Um, so this is where it starts. Before, before Eric Lander and David Botstein, we did not have any method to figure out what DNA is exactly doing. 
if this piece of DNA is controlling growth or if it's controlling like metabolites or if it's controlling like your weight. Um, that only started in uh, 19, uh, 1989. Um, so very recent, very, very novel technique, um, but very ancient in a way already. Um, so if you want to associate your phenotype with a genetic marker, you need a certain population. For example, I have 100 Arabidopsis plants. You need genetic markers, either using RFLP or using SNP chips, and you need to have a phenotype measured, like the yield of the plant or the weight of the plant. So three things required for association analysis, for QTL mapping. So let's talk about these populations that you need, right? Because these populations that you need need to be structured in a very, very structured way, right? So one of the things is you have, for example, the back cross. And so the back cross is we just take a mouse of which we know nothing, right? This is just a random mouse that I found in the street and I'm crossing it with my laboratory inbred mouse strain. So this is the standard strain. This is a black six. Um, this one I don't know because I just picked it up from the street. So I also know nothing about this genotype. But the laboratory strain, because it's our laboratory strain, it has been inbred for, for dozens of generations. It's genetically homozygous. Um, so he, every chromosome, if I look at chromosome one, the first one, and I look at the second copy of chromosome one in this inbred strain, um, the, they, they are the same, right? So, so we just call this mouse a, A. And that's just by definition. So then we cross this unknown mouse with this A, A mouse and now we get a generation of F1 individuals who are all genetically identical. Or are they? That's the big question, right? Because they probably are not. Because this mouse not has a single question mark, it actually has two question marks. Right, because that's that's the, the that's one of the issues here. But have we assume that this mouse is homozygous? It's probably not. But have we just assume that we cross it with an AA mouse? Then we get a, a mouse which is genetically identical. So all of these offspring more or less have an A allele from the from the black mouse, and they have an allele from the white mouse. And then what we do is we take these individuals and we cross them again with the original laboratory strain. And now the funny thing is, is these mice all are genetically identical because they, they have one allele from this and one allele from that. So they all look exactly the same. If you would do an F1 cross between uh, two inbred mice, then the children of these mice are all identical. Um, the only thing that's different is that some of them are male, some of them are female. Um, and that's because of the XY chromosome. Um, but if you then mate these individuals back with the uh, AA and the question mark I now go B, then now we end up with the um, back cross generation and the back cross generation um, variance just explodes. Um, these mice generally are a mixture between the, the one mouse and the other mouse, so they are gray, they are more or less having the same or a body weight which is in between the two parents. But as soon as we cross children from this cross back to the AA individuals, their children will look completely different. So they will have all kinds of colors, different dot patterns, they will have different weights, and that is because they are uh, genetically different. However, if we look at a certain marker, right, if we generate like a hundred of these little mice um, from this cross, um, then if we look at a, at a single marker, then at this marker, 75% of the animals will have the AA genotype and 25% will have the A question mark or the AB genotype. So there are some disadvantages to doing a cross like this um, because we can only see the, the, the effect of the AA allele, so the homozygous allele, towards the heterozygous allele. So we cannot say anything about additivity or dominance and we can only say that there's a, that there's a difference. And the effect size is relatively low because we only get like half of the additive effect. We cannot compare an AA individual to a BB individual. We can only compare an individual at a certain or individuals at a certain marker. So hey, we have a population of individuals which are AA, we have a small population which is AB, and we compare the difference between those. 
Um, and this is this is one of the basic crosses that you can do. It's relatively easy to do, uh, relatively quick, especially with mice, um, and it only takes you two generations. So you have to find a random mouse outside, you cross it with your laboratory mouse, and then you have another generation where you cross the offspring with the laboratory mouse again, and then in this generation you can then do the genotyping and then afterwards do the QTL mapping. But the disadvantages are you cannot know anything about additivity or dominance, um, and that the effect size is relatively low, um, because had the AB individuals are in the minority, so statistically it's not a very balanced test um, and you only get half of the total additive effect so you don't see the difference between AA and BB but you only see the difference between AA and AB. Alright so another way to kind of circumvent this is to make an F2 cross so an F2 cross is that you do the same thing as you did before so you generate these F1 mice but instead of crossing these F1 mice back to the known laboratory strain mouse you cross these brother sister so you take brothers and sisters and you mate them together and then head so that's what happens here so you have the the, the female parent the male parent and uh, then you have for example one male being born and and five females and then you just brother sister mate these and then out of this comes the f2 generation of course hip, when you uh, when you do that, um, the genotype frequencies start changing because these are AB, this one is AB as well. So what happens in the offspring generation, we now get individuals who are AA, one-fourth of the time. We get individuals who are AB, so heterozygous like half of the time. And we get BB individuals also one-fourth of the time. And this is just at a single marker, right? If I look at another marker, then we would find the same frequencies, um, but the same individual at marker one might be at marker one, it might be AA, um, but at marker two, it might the same individual might be AB. So this is just looking at a single marker in the genome. Another type of cross which is used a lot, um, especially in plants, not s well in mice, there are some uh, recombinant inbred lines as well. Um, but the recombinant inbred lines are um, made from the F2. So here we see how the uh, B6 and DBA mice, so this is one laboratory mouse, another laboratory mouse. We cross these two mice, we end up with heterozygotes, so the F1 population, which get one copy of the genome from the father, one copy of the genome from the mother. And then what we start doing is we start sibling mating these individuals, and then we generate like an F2 generation, but we don't stop with the F2 generation. What we do is within each of these pairs, right, because we don't have one, uh, we don't have two mice, but we have like 50 mice to start off with, um, and then have within each of these families, we start inbreeding. So we start, yeah, so we, we take the offspring of a single F1 cross and then we cross these together and then the children of this get crossed together again and crossed together again. Um, so it, the genome, what happens, stabilizes because every time you have a recombination, um, but at a certain point, um, these start becoming identical because at each marker, some allele, well, it won't be lost, but the allele will be stabilized uh, within this family. And so here we have then in the end we have three different lines, strain, well lines of this of this cross and these lines, so BXD1 will have a mixture, so a mosaic of the two parents but the animal after seven or eight generations will be fully inbred again. So we're just inbreeding to kind of stabilize the genome and of course because we do because the starting point is different. Uh, when we look at the second BXD, so not the second mouse, but the second line, uh, these animals will be completely different um, compared to BXD1, but again, their genome will be a mixture of the two original parents. Um, the advantages of this is that the genotype frequency at each marker across the population will be 50-50, half of the individuals will be AA, half of the individuals will be AB, so the advantage is, is that we get the full additive effect, right, because the, the, the we get like two A alleles versus two B alleles. Um, but the disadvantage of the recombinant inbred line is that you cannot look at additive and dominance. And 
Here I say seven or more generations of sibling mating, but in mice we need around 20 generations. So seven, eight generations generally is enough for plants or other animals, um, but in mice um, it is relatively hard to do because you have, hey, you're inbreeding animals, animals don't like to be inbred, and that also reduces their um, it reduces their fertility generally, so some of these lines will start dying out um, and it won't breed as well because of genetic um, disorders, because you're forcing them in a certain structure. Um, but the BXD strain um, is uh, one of the most well-known uh, mouse populations, I think, recombinant inbred line. And the nice thing, of course, is, is that if you cross a BXD1 male with a BXD1 female, then you get a BXD1 back, right? The genome of the, this mouse will be a clone of its parents because of the inbreeding. Um, so these mice or these mouse lines or, or lines as they are called, um, these lines are immortal. So you can study this mouse, your children can study the exact same mouse and your children's children can study the exact same mouse as well um, because of the fact that they are homozygous. So they are immortal. You can, you can make the same mouse again over and over again. And this has a very big advantage in, in, in science um, because you want to have reproducible research um, and you don't want to have mice which are one-off. All right, so summarized, if you do a back cross, this is quick and very easy to set up. It has a low resolution and we will see, uh, I will explain why. Um, it has a low effect size and you don't get any information about additive or dominant effect. Um, the F2 is kind of in the middle. It's not too complex. Um, you just, hey, you, you sibling mate them. Um, you get information about additive versus dominant effects, but the resolution is generally limited, so medium resolution, slightly better than the back cross. Um, but again, you have low power um, because of the 25, 50, 25 um, structure. The recombinant inbred line is the most powerful or the more powerful to detect effects because you have the full additive effect because individuals are either homozygous AA or homozygous BB. It gives you very good resolution because this, this splintering up of the genome is different for all of these lines and generally you make like 100 or 150 of these lines. So the resolution is very good when you do a QTL mapping. Um, but it, again, doesn't have any information like additive and dominance um, because it suffers from the same, same issue as the back cross because you only have AA versus BB and you don't have the uh, heterozygous. All right, so these are the three majorly used crosses. Um, there are some other complex crosses. So, for example, there are crosses which instead of starting with two mice, so uh, um, um, uh, an inbred line one and an inbred line two, um, you have, for example, the collaborative cross in mice. So the collaborative cross in mice is a recombinant inbred line made via the same structure as before. However, this is made from eight different founders. So there is a, let's say you should start with eight different inbred mice strains, you cross them together and then you, you start in the children crossing them again. So you have a more complex crossing scheme, um, but in the end you have eight alleles floating around instead of just two alleles. Um, yeah, so you don't have an A and a B, you have an A, B, C, D, E, F, G, um, H, I. Yeah, so you have eight different alleles. Um, the same system as the collaborative cross was used. So the collaborative cross um, is a very interesting project. Um, I was not really involved, but when I was doing my PhD, they were setting up this collaborative cross in mice. Um, they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars making this cross. Um, it was made in like five different locations in the world, so it was a massive project um, between Europe, uh, the USA, um, Israel was involved, um, so the, the, and also the Australians were involved. Um, they wanted to make a thousand different lines, um, but in the end they only ended up making like 70 or something because 970 lines died out during the generation. And that is because mice do not really like to be inbred. If you start inbreeding animals, uh, then fertility just drops off a cliff and you get mice which do not 
breed anymore and are not able to produce offspring. So the collaborative cross is like a really, really good resource that people try to set up, um, but in the end um, it suffered from a lot of infertility problems. But it taught us a lot about how fertility works, especially in male mice, um, since it it ends up being the males who are usually infertile because females do the meiosis stuff when they are still in, in the womb. Um, but for male mice, inbreeding is a massive, massive issue. Um, this cost us, I think, 15 years, um, perhaps even longer. So uh, Gary Churchill, the guy who came up with the idea, um, spent almost half of his career uh, doing this. Um, and then the guys in the Arabidopsis thaliana, so in the, in the plant community, um, they did the exact same, but they did it in a week. And that is because plants just, you can, you don't have to breed them, then mate them. And if for a plant, you can just take eight different ecotypes from Arabidopsis. So you have, for example, the Arabidopsis from Colombia, um, you have the Landsberg erecta, you have the, the CVI, so the Cape Verdean Island ones. Um, so in Wageningen, uh, they took eight different ecotypes of Arabidopsis and then you just use like a little pencil and you just mate the plant and you can do that in a week. So they did in a week what in the mouse community took around 10 years to accomplish. Um, of course, the inbreeding still needed to be done, of course, but in the end, the magic cross is much more successful um, because it also doesn't suffer from the same inbreeding depression as the mice do. Um, the diversity outbred is kind of the same. It also has eight inbred founders, the same eight inbred founders as the mouse collaborative cross strain, um, but um, it is an outbred population. So the nice thing here is that these 70 lines that survived, they are immortal. So you can keep them forever and ever. The same thing holds for the uh, magic lines of the Arabidopsis um, recombinant inbred line population. The diversity outbred population is an outbred population. So every animal is a mix of these eight founders. Um, but since they are not inbred, you can only get a mouse once. You cannot have repeated measurements on the same mouse. And of course, here, when you do more complex crosses, then there's no analysis software, there's no statistics. Um, they are not readily available and are being developed. Um, currently, it is more or less done for the collaborative cross and also for the magic lines. So, But it took us a couple of years to get everything in order um, to be able to map these uh, map, map QTLs in these population. All right, so linkage analysis. So let's start, right? So now we have our population, we force our population. So at a certain marker, an individual can have like two or three different allele states. Um, have, what do we want to do with it? Well, we take a hundred mice from, for example, an F2 cross. We measure these hundred mice for the length of their tail. And then uh, we do association analysis. So we try to see if there's a locus in the genome where the genotype is correlated or associated with the phenotype. Um, there's two flavors, like I told you, there's QTL mapping. QTL mapping uses these populations and you have genome-wide association. Genome-wide association um, is using outbred populations. So when you are not forcing individuals in a certain um, in a certain order. And of course, linkage analysis only works for phenotypes that are heritable. Not only that, but there are some other drawbacks, um, but this is the main one. So if you are interested in a phenotype and you want to know if there's any genes in the genome involved in regulating your phenotype, then you can only do that when your phenotype is heritable. If your phenotype is not heritable, then you can't use QTL mapping or genome-wide association to find genes um, involved in this process. All right, so the first step is to create a genetic map. So you use primers and PCR or you use SNP, SNP chips. Um, nowadays, we also do it for methylation markers where we look not so much at the, the content of the DNA, but we look at the methylation state of the DNA. Um, but in the old days, we just used primers and PCR. Um, nowadays, we use genotyping assays, just using SNP chips. Um, and had, so multiple markers together form a genetic map. 
So you genotype each individual at each marker. So you have like 150 markers across the genome at which you want to um, um, calculate um, or in which you want to measure. And then you measure um, these 150 markers in your 500 plants or in your 150 mouse. Then the next step is to calculate your genotype probabilities. That you can only do this when you do QTL, and I'm not going to explain this. If people are interested in that, then I can talk more about that later. Um, but the, the idea is that you just perform basic association analysis. So how does basic association analysis look? So here we have the genotype. So we have individual one. Individual one had a yield of six and a half kilograms. Um, here we have individual n, which had 9.6 kilograms. And here we have the genotype, right? So if we look at the first marker, and then we saw that some individuals were AA, some individuals were BB. So I'm only using a single letter instead of two letters, um, just to keep the slide a little bit shorter. Yeah, so this is homozygous AA, homozygous BB. So we have marker one, marker two, uh, we have marker three, four and so forth. So we have a whole bunch of markers across the genome. And what do we now start doing? Now we, we just start looking at each marker. So each marker divides the population into two. There's individuals which have the A genotype. There's individuals which have the B genotype. And we just want to ask the question, if the mean of A is smaller than the mean of B, or if the mean of A is larger than the mean of B. So if we do that and we look at the first marker, what happens is that, well, both of them are around the same, right? So if I calculate the mean, then I just add up 9.1 plus 9.6 plus 7.5 plus 7.0, and then I add up the A's, and then I just look, is the mean of A different from the mean of B? So in this case, they're more or less identical. At the next marker, we see that something interesting happens, right? Because all of the individuals that carry the AA allele are having a low yield, while all individuals that carry the BB allele have a high yield. So this is what we call a QTL, a quantitative trait locus, a locus at which there is an association between the A genotype and low yield and the B genotype leading to high yield. The next marker, again, not a lot of difference. Next marker, again, not a lot of difference, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. So you see that in the end, we are creating kind of a, a profile across the genome or across a chromosome. Here, there's something interesting because here we see that this marker actually gives us the opposite information compared to the marker here. Here, all the individuals carrying the B allele are having a low yield. All individuals that carry the A allele are having a high yield. So in this case, we cannot decide if it is marker two which is responsible for the yield, or if it is this marker number 08, uh, 9. Right? We, we can't decide. So there is an association with marker A, uh, with marker 2, there's an association with marker 9, um, yeah, but in this case we cannot decide which one of the two it is. Um, but this is just how QTL mapping works. So this is all. You just get the yields, you get the genotypes measured using your SNP chips, um, and then you just look if the mean of A is smaller than the mean of B, or if the mean of A is larger than the mean of B. And so on. Is this clear? Everyone still awake? Just do a <laughs> shout out in chat. Um, but that, that's all. That's that's what linkage analysis is. This is, this is one of the most famous papers in the history of, of genetics. They just describe doing this. Calculate the mean of A, calculate the mean of B, um, compare them. If there's a difference, that's where your gene of interest is. There's a gene there which causes your phenotypes to change. Um, 1989. Right? So still then you could write papers which like nowadays seem very very um, smart it is a very smart idea actually um, that all right so there's two types of effects right so if we if we go back um, with the AA AB and BB right so if we look into an F2 
um, then we can have an additive uh, effect of a marker. Um, so that means that having one copy of the B allele increases your phenotype by X. Having two copies of the B allele um, increases your phenotype by 2X. Right? So this is called an additive effect because the B allele has a certain effect. It makes you bigger or it makes the yield bigger. Having two B alleles just makes the yield twice as big. Um, so that, that means that an additive effect means that alleles are contributing equal um, and it looks like this. Then there's also a dominance effect at the marker and that means that one allele dominates. So if we, if, if we do a certain marker, right, and we have an F2 population and we see this structure, then we say, oh, this is a dominance inheritance effect. And the allele here, which is dominant, that's a good question. Because you've been listening to me, what is the dominant allele? I've actually asked this question at a PhD defense of someone getting his PhD thesis and they weren't able to answer the question. But you guys should be now. Because you, you follow the course, right? So. <laughs> so in this structure, right, which allele is dominating? Is it the A allele or is it the B allele which is dominating? Yes, B. Yeah, because if you have a single B allele, you jump up to being the high uh, phenotype. So this is just a dominance effect. So you have the additive effect, you have the dominance effect, and there's all kinds of other effects. And like I showed you, sometimes the children are higher uh, than the parents, sometimes they are lower. So you can have like over dominance and under dominance, and uh, there's all kinds of different structures. Um, sometimes the AA group and the BB group have the same mean, and the, 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 the AB group hovers in between, but that's, that's the basic idea. Um, so here we are only looking at the effect, right? So we're looking if the mean of A is different from the mean of B. Um, but since we are doing science, we also want to know how likely this is, right? Because there might be a big difference between A and B, but if the standard deviation of the A group is very big and the standard deviation of the B group is very big, then this effect might still not be real. It might be that there seems to be a big effect, um, but this is just because there's a massive standard deviation in both AA and BB. Um, so how do we how do we then do this? So in the previous example, we use the means. Um, so we are mapping the effect of a quantitative rate, the trade locus. And how likely this effect is, we can test just using statistics. So we can just do a basic t-test in the case of uh, two alleles, right? If you have only AA and BB, then we can just t-test the, um, the A group versus the B group. Um, but in, in many cases, if for example, if we do an F2 cross where we have three alleles, so we have AA, AB and BB, um, then of course this effect is, is more difficult to disentangle. Um, so, and then we need to use something like an ANOVA or we need to use something like linear regression uh, to figure out the effects um, in, in this uh, situation. So. Um, I like t-testing, some people like ANOVAs, um, I like ANOVAs as well, some people like linear regression, I like linear regression as well, but it's up to you what you want to use. You can use any kind of statistics um, to kind of show that this is a significant effect. When we do this p-value calculation, right, we calculate a p-value for each of these markers, um, but in QTL we always show lot scores, and that is because um, because of the reason that it that it looks better. Um, so what is a lot score? A lot score is a logarithm of odds. Um, so what we do is we take the minus log 10 of the p-value. So that means that um, if you have a p-value of 1 times 10 to the minus 5, right, because we take the minus log 10, this just becomes a score of 5. Um, so if you see a lot score of 5, then that means that the likelihood that this effect is real is 1 times 10 to the minus 5. If you see a lot score of 30, it means that the probability of this 
effect being real is 1 times 10 to the minus 30. Um, and it just looks better when you when you plot it. Of course, we have to deal with multiple testing as well. Um, because we are doing a uh, an association analysis, we're not just doing a single test, but we're testing like every marker, right? So we do a hundred uh, we do a hundred markers, so we have to correct for that. Um, so we have to do a multiple testing correction, and we do that just by using a, by adjusting the the lot threshold. So the lot threshold just goes up. The more markers we test, the higher the threshold, and the lot threshold in QTL mapping is determined by minus log ten of zero point zero five, or uh, depending on what if you want to have a suggestive, a significant, or a very significant level, and then you divide the zero point zero five by the number of markers times the number of phenotypes. So it's just a basic Bonferroni adjustment. Um, of your um, p or of your of your p value, and then you take the minus log ten of your adjusted p value, and this is called the lot threshold. All right, so we're going to take a short break here. I've been talking for almost more than an hour already again, so I will.